We currently live in the era of the most plentiful food ever in world history. Sitting in my living room typing out this episode, I can DoorDash just about any kind of food I want at a relatively reasonable price. In the pre-industrial world, your average family put more than half of their income into food, and today your average American spends 7%. There are twice as many fat people as there are hungry around the world, and if you go to countries like America, Mexico, or many of the Arab nations, you'll find obesity is the norm. In my years of studying theology, I've come to the conclusion God is the greatest comedian of all time, and thus in this era of such high food abundance that's literally the greatest cause of death in America, the world will face what will undoubtedly be the largest and bloodiest famine in history. Intrigued? Let me explain this one out. On the ride of explaining what will occur, we will gradually tease out the kind of world that will develop from it. There's a lot of research that goes into making these videos, and reading takes up a lot of my time. But thankfully, Audible is everything I need to get a better grasp of the world. Audible is something for everyone and is easy to use, and as an Audible member, you get one free title for each month, regardless of its cost. Audible is everything from college course lectures to audiobooks and podcasts, covering any topic you can think of. It's truly a wealth of knowledge and at a very affordable rate. They also offer a bulk deal for buying three credits at a discount, which comes in handy when getting a series or exploring different genres. I'm currently reading The Barbarous Years on Audible, which is a really fascinating book about the British colonization of the New World, and it goes through Jamestown, the Dutch settlement in New York, the Puritans in New England, and how each of them had to deal with establishing a new society in a very different part of the world and all the craziness attached to that. I definitely recommend it. No matter what you're looking for, Audible is something for you. Audible is currently offering a 30-day free trial to anyone who wants to sign up, which is a really great deal. So visit audible.com slash whatifaltist or text whatifaltist to 500-500 and listen to whatever calls you today. Before I get going, I'd like to thank my researcher Seamus Duffy, who's a brilliant friend of mine who writes reports for me on topics that I can't get in as much depth about. His reports on global agriculture and fertilizer are how I'm getting information for this video. Likewise, the broader theory and the person who realized initially that the world could be poised for a famine right now is Peter Zihan, whose analyses of how the world order could collapse are remarkable. To be honest, this topic's insanely complicated, and the most apt metaphor is something near to my heart. Heavy metal. I'm obsessed with metal, and since I'm an audio learner, I think in sound, so I view history and the topics I discuss on this show through the lens of metal. The drums are the demographics, the bass, the political side, the leadership, the lead vocalist, etc. All working together at the same time in their own parts to create the beat and rhythm that is history. You can sense the song building up for a drop, but it would be hard to pick out the exact instrument that's pushing it. I'm bringing this up especially for this topic, given that all of the things described here will happen incredibly quickly at the same time, and it's going to be remarkably difficult to parcel out which variables went wrong where. Everything here is connected with everything else, so once a match gets lighted, the fire is going to spread quickly. What we're trying to do here is to analyze a metal song from reading what each instrument's doing, which feels very clinical, often boring at times to be honest, but the truth is that when it occurs, it will be anything but, rushing upon the world as an overbearing force. We'll be looking at cereals or grains here. Not like breakfast cereals, but wheat, rice, etc., which form around half the calories people around the world consume. But that varies a lot, where in richer countries, people have more proteins and fats, and in poorer ones, they're more heavily dependent upon just cereals. Meat and vegetables are more locally produced, with cereals being very overrepresented for the global agricultural market. Whether or not the world starves is largely dependent upon the global cereal market. Another note being that in all the cereal crops, the top 10 nations produce close to 90% of exports, meaning that if those countries have problems, the whole world market collapses. The best place to start to look at with this topic is just to have a look at what places make food and what places get the food. To do this, let's draw a brief mental map of the global food market. 
A good general rule is that North America is not just self-sufficient, but an exporter in basically everything between oil, natural gas, iron, lumber, food, industrial goods, and the global cereal market's no different, with the U.S. being broadly the world's top agricultural exporter, and after that, Canada really punches above its weight. Argentina and Brazil are also some of the largest agricultural exporters in the world, while the rest of the Americas kind of break even. The nations of the Americas all predominantly export corn and wheat. Europe is a large food exporter, but since it has much less arable land than the Americas and a much larger population, it produces lots of food but doesn't export it to the same degree as the New World, given it just eats the food. The exception to this is Russia and Ukraine, who are some of the world's largest grain exporters in the world. Meanwhile, the Middle East and North Africa nearby are the world's biggest food importers, being 10% of the world's population but 40% of the international grain market. This is the biggest worry area in the world when it comes to food. After it comes Sub-Saharan Africa, which is also dependent on food imports, but less so than the Middle East. Finally, we move on to the world of rice, a South and East Asia where a majority of mankind resides. India is the largest rice exporter by a factor of three, while Thailand and Vietnam distantly tail. Meanwhile, China is a massive food exporter, but also a massive food importer, being probably the country with the most complicated food supply of anywhere on the planet. Now with this map of net food creditors and debtors, we can gradually work back to figure out how the world's food supply will work out over the next few months. The main driving factor being in effect the former Mongol Empire, or Russia, China, and allies, removal from the world system. With the Russia and Ukraine war, both countries have been taken out of the global agricultural market. Russia can't export grain due to the trade embargo it has been put under, while at the same time it doesn't have any year-round ports, with their ports in the Baltic, Arctic Sea, and Pacific iced over during the winter. Meanwhile, Russian ships can't get out through the Black Sea due to the war and the sea lanes being mined. And no shipping company, and no insurance company backing them, is willing to put slow-moving grain ships through a war zone. On the Ukrainian side, their most fertile fields in their agricultural sector is largely either in a war zone or under Russian occupation. The Russians and Ukrainians being knocked out would contribute to the fall of 20% of the global grain market. The only way grain can get out of this region is from a negotiated treaty with the United States to escort Russian ships through the Black Sea, or alternatively a peace treaty between Ukraine and Russia. Considering we're in late October already, the second option seems unlikely before winter. For the first option, this would be a very difficult move for the American Democrats to try to pull before a midterm in which they are already predicted to perform very poorly. At the same time, with the Ukrainians winning the war, asking for some kind of truce with Russia would optically be very bad for the West. Making this sort of decision, especially when the Western chattering classes view Russia with such vehement hatred, would be politically very difficult to pull off. I was once talking to a friend about how the Americans, who come from such a food-plenty society, could deal with letting much of the third world starve, to which his reply was, we do the normal thing of donating to charities that aren't effective, thus absolving ourselves and trying to forget it was happening. The countries that can pick up the slack for Eastern Europe and wheat are in the New World. Brazil, however, is incapable of doing so, and Argentina, in their classic fashion, is currently going through 70% inflation in an economy and society incapable of rapid, coherent change to expand production to even close to the degree needed. The U.S., again, in classic American fashion, puts 40% of its massive corn harvest into ethanol production, or a synthetic form of oil that it can use for cars. First of all, the kinds of corn involved are barely edible, but on top of that, with some of the highest gas prices on record, with that even being a major sticking point in the next midterms, the Biden administration has kept ethanol production on track and will likely ask for it to rise. Americans would simply not think a massive rise in their gas prices be an okay substitute to seeing prices rise in the third world for food, largely since the U.S. is such a car-driven society. Wheat looks pretty scary, but rice is even worse. As mentioned before, the rice market's dominated by two titans, China and India. Both countries have experienced truly terrible harvests due to drought this year. India has cut off its exports, thus decreasing the global rice market by 20%. Pakistan, the fourth largest exporter, is also now largely offline due to the massive floods that have just recently occurred there. China has also likewise shut down exports. China is really complicated here given that it's one of the areas where politics intersects with economics to a degree where it's impossible to disentangle them. Also, things are getting even more complicated in that due to them turning into an Orwellian totalitarian state, removing all foreign journalists, meaning we don't really know what's going on inside that country. 
For more information on China, I would watch this video. However, the long and short of it is that China is experiencing a crisis in leadership in which to show his authority, Xi Jinping has been doing some incredibly aggressive and downright self-destructive economic policies in the name of trying to completely destroy COVID. This has involved things like preventing farmers from planting in their fields, preventing trade between different provinces, shutting cities off from imports, and causing genuine starvation in many places. Then you combine this with one of the worst droughts in modern history in the rice-producing regions of South China. The truth about China is we really don't know the state of their agriculture, but guessing from how many of those policies would have completely disrupted their agriculture, likely fertilizer especially, occurred during the spring planting season, I'm not optimistic about China's harvest this year. Under optimal circumstances, China could probably feed itself cut off from the rest of the global economy. But we're not dealing with optimal circumstances here thus meaning China could possibly experience mass hunger. On top of this crisis in food itself is fertilizer. This might sound boring or technical, but in fact, fertilizer is the most important matter in the modern world. The thing that allows the world to support the truly massive population it has. The world's population has quadrupled since World War II, and fertilizer is one of the biggest factors, with Africa being a great example in that Africa's population has gone up by a factor of five since 1950, as has its agricultural productivity. Fertilizer is a big part of what separates the modern industrial world in which 0.5% of the population are farmers normally from the pre-industrial world in which 90% of people were. Half of calories in the whole world are dependent upon the international fertilizer trade. There are three different kinds of fertilizer that are all necessary for a stable agricultural process, those being nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash. Nitrogen, due to the brilliant process invented by Fritz Haber that allowed Germany to fight World War I, can be pulled out of the air, and so most countries make nitrogen locally. However, nitrogen takes a tremendous amount of energy to make. The global nitrogen market is projected to be fine. For the production of the other two, phosphorus and potash, it's more difficult and it's more geographically disparate. The producers of these two minerals come from similar countries as global food exporters in general, being Canada and the US, Belarus, China, and Russia. But on top of that are two wild cards, Saudi Arabia and Morocco. Like the world's agricultural supply, China and Russia have largely gone offline for political reasons. China has completely banned phosphate exports, accounting for 15% of the global supply, while meanwhile China has released its strategic potash reserves for their domestic usage only, meaning their supplies must be very low to warrant that. China could be incredibly worrying when it comes to fertilizer, given their internal supply system is just so screwed up. But the data is difficult to connect because we don't really have any good sources of information coming out of China now. Russia, which is a major producer of all three kinds of fertilizer, has also been taken offline. Added together with China and Russia being off the global market, we're looking at potash going down 18%, nitrogen over a quarter, and phosphorus at 30%. This is really bad, with one-third falls in vital components for global agriculture to survive. However, when we look at the cascading effects on global agriculture and the other fertilizer producers, things are looking very scary. The top of which is Europe, which takes in a large amount of the Russian fertilizers, with a massive population of 600 million and truly huge agricultural sector. However, this connects with the broader problem that Europe also gets a majority of its natural gas from Russia and Eastern Europe which has since been completely cut off by the war in Ukraine. However, the main thing needed to make nitrogen fertilizer is cheap energy, and much of Europe will struggle to heat their buildings and keep their lights on, let alone use the massive amounts of energy needed to make nitrogen fertilizer. European countries will have to make the decision, will they keep their lights on or will they have higher food prices, which will mostly go to the third world by not having enough fertilizer. And I mean, the European Union has already made that decision, and they're cutting their nitrogen production by two-thirds. However, removing nitrogen would have Europe's crop for the next year, and Europe is a large food exporter, so Europeans will largely be fine. They'll probably just eat less meat or something. This ironically also comes at the kind of hilarious timing in Europe in which many Europeans are already weakening their food and energy supplies for climate reasons. The Dutch are literally cutting down on their cattle herds for environmental reasons, and the Germans have been shutting down their coal and nuclear plants right at the time while Europe will face a scarcity of food and energy. However, the effects of this will be deleterious upon the rest of the world, especially so for the nearby Middle East and North Africa, which are largely dependent upon food imports from Europe. An important fact to keep in mind is that the US and Europe are a quarter of the world's economy each. Well, say the whole continent of Africa combined has an economy smaller than Britain's. 
This means that in any kind of financial bidding war, the West, which food-wise will do generally fine, has so much more bidding power than the third world who really needs this stuff. A really horrifying thing to consider is that the West might take in a good amount of extra food so as to stabilize their already unstable societies, while the cost might be downright starvation for tens of millions elsewhere. This brings us to another point, Latin America. Tropical soils are of almost universally poor quality. This means that they use higher amounts of fertilizer for the same amount of land. This also combined with generally less effective agricultural techniques means the third world uses a higher proportion of its fertilizer than it probably should. The U.S. uses 120 units of fertilizer for each acre, Brazil 240, China 360, and Egypt 570. However, due to Brazil's geography, it is incredibly dependent upon imports of fertilizer. However, at the same time, Brazil is poor enough that in a fertilizer bidding war, it will probably lose. Given Brazil is one of the world's largest food exporters, its own citizens will likely largely be fine. However, this will further cut down upon the world's global agricultural supply. If the Middle East is the area that's most disproportionate in grain markets, Latin America is the same thing with fertilizer, being most dependent upon foreign fertilizer inputs. Thus, a crisis of global fertilizer will likely temporarily take Latin America out of global agriculture thus further raising the price of food for the next year. This then brings us to the next point, that with the European food and Latin food supplies crashing, it brings up a good chance that it could topple the next great fertilizer producers, the Moroccans and Saudis. Saudi Arabia makes up 15% of global phosphorus on the Persian Gulf side of their country, inhabited by the oppressed Shia minority, while the Moroccans make up 30% of global phosphorus. They do this in the Western Sahara, a uninhabited piece of desert, they contest with the Sahrawi Pact, a native tribal group backed by their rival Algeria, which, I mean, to me sounds like the plot of Dune. However, Saudi Arabia and Morocco are both incredibly dependent upon global food supplies. In Saudi Arabia, the truly massive amount of government wealth might be able to make up part of the slack by basically paying for the country's bread, but for other reasons, I would say that Saudi Arabia is one of the most revolution-prone countries in the world today. Also, if anything goes wrong elsewhere in the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz are cut off, it would likely be impossible to ship Saudi Arabia's phosphorus across the desert hundreds of miles to go out through the Red Sea. Likewise, Morocco is no such luck. In both cases, the phosphorus is mined in borderlands inhabited by native populations who don't like the ruling government. Both are backed by neighboring unfriendly powers, whether Iran or Algeria, making their mining difficult to hold down. If Morocco or Saudi Arabia go offline, it cuts the global phosphorus by additional half on top of the 30% lost from China and Russia, meaning the only effective producers left will be North America. A point I'd like to stress again here is that each of these subcomponents of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash are necessary for the agricultural process. So you can't substitute nitrogen out for phosphorus, for example. So an 80% drop in phosphorus, in effect, translates to the whole world agricultural fertilizer system going down by 80%. North America is currently trying to improve production as so to pick up the slack, but this is only starting now, and the process of establishing new phosphorus or potash mines takes five years at least, thus meaning the world has a lot of pain to go through before America can refill the global market. I was reading a book on the fall of the Bronze Age world. For those that don't know, that was a crazy era in history, in which, in the 12th century BC, the centuries-old states of the Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean fell in a 30-year period. The cities fell into ruin, the governments died out, and the previous age stopped. The theory that this book posited, and the topic is incredibly complicated with a bunch of variables in general, was something called complexity theory. It goes something like a system can only maintain so much complexity and interdependence before it falls. What it posited was that the world of over 3,000 years ago became so intertwined that once one match started to burn, the whole structure fell down. Their social system, for example, was dependent upon copper and tin, from which they made their weaponry, which were sourced from as far away in as Britain and Afghanistan, and with the collapse in that international trade, so went their whole social system. It's much more complicated than that, but I think the modern world in which the things people eat, the energy with which they power their lives, and the weapons with which they wage war are all dependent upon resources from the other side of the world. Just from the former Mongol Empire going offline for this winter through both fertilizer and actual grain shipments, we should expect the average person around the world to lose something around 500 calories. 
That doesn't sound like a lot. It's less than a brownie sundae. However, something to consider is how statistical averages have long tails, or how data ends up manifesting in really skewed ways as applied in the real world. An important thing to consider is that averages tend to be made artificially high by a couple outliers, thus the calorie loss will end up being much greater in large parts of the world. 500 calories for an American is a healthy diet, where you should probably end up doing that for real, but for a significant part of the world, it's literally starving to death. One of the things which we've alluded to before is just that this disproportionately hits certain areas of the world. Another important variable is that it's heavily divided by class, where say Mexico is one of the highest obesity rates around the world at somehow three quarters of the population, while also having 10% of the population being hungry, and that's split on class lines. An important other variable is that food's inelastic in that people will always do everything they can to eat. The reason things like the Ukraine war cause such disproportionate rises in the price of gas is that oil is also inelastic, in that people will pay any cost for oil since they need it for modern civilization to function. You aren't willing to pay very much for corn when you're full, but when you're hungry you will do anything for it. This means that fluctuations in the supply of food will cause disproportionate rises in the price of food. At the same time, when the price of something goes up enough, it naturally becomes a commodity, in that people buy it up so to gouge the price even higher. In corrupt and inefficient countries, this price will likely be even higher. A bigger factor that overarches all of this is that as one part of the world system goes down or gets weakened, it further promulgates weakness elsewhere thus resulting in a cascading effect that creates more bad upon bad. Hell, this whole YouTube channel seems like talking about various things that can go wrong in the current global system, all of which is dependent upon the food supply. Whether with civil wars, external wars, plagues, resource crises, depressions and the like, they all relate back to food being the ultimate thing that lets us live. Once people get hungry, they stop being rational and will do anything to feed their bellies. Our brains are designed to eat first and be rational later, thus meaning we're basically waiting for much of the third world to have revolutions or state collapses. I was talking to Seamus about the area I thought would get hit the hardest. He said the Middle East and I said Sub-Saharan Africa. Given that the Middle East was more dependent upon food imports than anywhere else in the world, but Africa was so much less stable that if something were to go wrong, the whole supply system would collapse, thus creating worse compounding effects. Thus you are in all likelihood looking at a crisis that will be worse than what I've ever gone through here. Just in short order from the former Mongol Empire shutting off, you'd get Europe becoming poor and economically barely getting by, thus resulting in the mass rise to power of far-right parties. We have the Middle East and Africa collapse into famine and Latin America turning inwards. You have what amounts to a compression of the global economy. Just think of what the effects of just the former Mongol Empire going offline, and then imagine adding those other countries onto the list. I mean, just think of the Middle East oil or the coltane ships that go in your phone that are mined in the Congo just for two easy examples. As a general rule, if your society was successful and wealthy in the Bronze Age, expect it to do poorly in the crisis to come. The top country I'm worried about is Egypt, with its 100 million people and having no tradable resources or manufacturing. After it comes Pakistan, which also has very similar issues, as well as recently having crippling flooding. Expect whatever world crisis to come to be kickstarted by a revolution in the Middle East, which will then cascade across the region. After these two, I worry at the whole so-called arc of instability, stretching across Africa into Central Asia, all of which have serious food security issues. In Sub-Saharan Africa, expect the melting of the traditional nation, which was already weak there. In this area, more so than anywhere else, this process would result in the erosion of functioning institutions like electricity, roads, trade, and the like. Of all areas in the world, I expect Africa to get hit the hardest. Expect hunger across Asia for similar reasons with their rice markets in very bad shape. It's hard to say what might happen in China short of massive political strife. Predicting the end result of all that's here is difficult to do, given if this occurs, it will likely be a seminal moment in history. 
The next generation will probably change its worldview and philosophy around what occurred in this famine. In all likelihood, people will view it as a tragedy similar to World War I, an irrepressible force caused by human foolishness combined with the horrible tragedy of the commons that forever changed how people viewed and lived in the world. Before we start, I do want to have a word of humility and just say I am not a wizard with a crystal ball that perfectly shows me the future. And there are ways this crisis could not happen, and because I'm predicting it happening so soon, that just makes it more likely that it's not going to happen. And the data I could be looking at could be wrong, I could be misinterpreting it, and because they're looking at so many third world countries, data often isn't perfect. But on top of that, the big thing that could stop this crisis is if the former Mongol Empire does go back online into the world system, where, let's say the war with Russia and Ukraine ends pretty soon, and thus, the Russians are able to get to trade with the whole world system again, and everything goes back to normal. Similarly, if China totally changes its political direction and is able to return to the world order, however, from looking at both of those countries, that seems unlikely to me now. And if you watch the rest of these videos, you will see that the world has everything lined up for a major crisis over the next decade. And so even if this crisis doesn't happen exactly as predicted here, I think the chances that some form of it will happen at some point seem decently high. 